Amen. Time does pass very, very rapidly. We're ready to go, the man says. All right. Well, I have to tell you that I had a whole lot of difficulty trying to determine what my second lesson was going to be. I had already determined that, that all of my lessons were going to be on the Olivet Discourse, and I'll share something with you. Uh, for months, I have been telling my wife, I'm not going to prepare PowerPoints this year. I'm just going to get up, I'm going to speak extemporaneously, as it were, uh, just go with the flow. I enjoy doing that kind of speaking. And uh, about last Thursday or Friday, I've forgotten which day it was, it suddenly dawned on me, well, you know, the PowerPoints really aren't for me, they're for the audience. Speaking of which, several of you have asked about getting the PowerPoints of all of the speakers who have used PowerPoints or used charts. Uh, we are requesting that each one of the speakers provide to me or send it to Daniel Rogers. If you know his address, he can give it to you. Your PowerPoints. And what Daniel is going to do is going to prepare it to put it on, on YouTube, Facebook, my websites, what have you. And so you will have access free of charge to all of the PowerPoints and all of the outlines that we as the speakers have prepared for you. Well, anyway, last Thursday or Friday, I'm going, well, maybe I ought to prepare PowerPoints after all. And I'm thinking, well, okay, I've got, uh, I've got three lessons to give because I knew that our, our entertainment for this evening had had to cancel out due to the medical emergency. So, in preparing for three lessons, I came up with four PowerPoint presentations. And I'm going, I know what I want to do for the first one. I know what I want to do for the third one. The last ones, what am I going to do with those two in the middle? I actually thought about getting up and saying, okay, folks, here are your choices. Now, the choices were, number one, were the disciples confused or wrong when they asked their questions, tell us when shall these things be, what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? 99.9.9% .9 of all commentators say the disciples were confused. Well, to me, if you demonstrate that the disciples were not confused to link Christ's coming and the end of the age, then you've proven the unity of the, of the Olivet Discourse. Choice number two, verse 36 of Matthew 24, 36 of Matthew 24. But of that day and hour knows no one but the Father only. And the reason that I settled on what I have is because the number one argument that I get on YouTube, Facebook, private correspondence, email correspondence, when we start talk and when I start talking about the language of the eminence in the New Testament, the number one response is, "Look, you can, you can't be right in saying that the New Testament writers said the day of the Lord was at hand and they knew what they were talking about because after all." Jesus said, oh, but of that day and hour knows no man. So I finally settled on that issue. Do we have, yeah, we're, we're all set up here. All right. When we come to Matthew chapter 24, 36, that verse is seen, and some commentators have called this Robert Taylor, who was rather prominent member, uh, minister in the Churches of Christ, wrote a book some years ago on the last things. And he did what he called an exegesis of Matthew 24. And I'm not trying to be unkind at all, but it was very poor, very weak. It wasn't exegetical. It was assumptive, assumptive. But he came to verse 36 and he said, this verse serves as the continental divide 
of the Olivet Discourse. And he claimed that there was just undeniable evidence that in this verse, Jesus was changing the subject from the fall of Jerusalem, his coming on the clouds in verse 29 to 31, to now Jesus is talking about his literal visible coming at the end of time, the end of the Christian age. And so he spent considerable time seeking to prove that. We are told that up to verse 36, Jesus referred to, it shall be in those days. But now in verse 36, all of a sudden, he speaks of that day, which raises the question, well, you know, in Matthew 24, 29 to 31, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give its light, the stars of heaven shall fall from the sky. They shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Kind of makes you wonder if that coming isn't that day. If it's not the consummative event of those days. Matter of fact, when you do a comparison, and Ed Stevens years and years ago produced a chart a comparative chart between Matthew 24 and Luke chapter 17. It was a fantastic chart. It's extremely powerful, demonstrating that when you take Luke chapter 17, lay it side by side with Matthew chapter 24, you can't get two subjects out of that without extremely distorting the text and without ignoring the parallels. Now, when Jesus said, no one knows that day, not the angels, not the Son, but the Father, this supposedly demands that Jesus was changing the subject from His coming in judgment of Jerusalem in AD 70 to the end of the Christian age, which has no end anyway. And I've just got to make a, a pause right here, and I'll be covering this more in my third lesson tomorrow. This simple but profound fact that the Christian age has no end. In 2016, I had a second debate with Dr. David Hester, and I had that debate in Montgomery, Alabama. And I'll never forget just the visual effect. In my very first affirmative, as almost a minor point, but not one that nonetheless I wanted to emphasize, I made the observation that David Hester believes that the coming of Christ is at the end of the Christian age. But the Bible affirms that Christ's new covenant age has no end. So let me share something with you very quickly. I don't have a chart on this. It's actually in the other chart on the disciples' questions. But you have to understand something about the, the dominant Jewish belief in the time of Jesus, a belief that had existed for centuries. It is a belief that is shared by the New Testament writers. As virtually, by the way, as virtually all commentators agree up to a point. And then they kind of go wonky and they abandon their agreement. And Alan touched on this a while ago and did a really good job on it. But I'm going to simplify it even more from what Alan shared with us. In the Jewish mentality of the first century and again centuries before, there was a belief that there were two overarching ages. Now, did the Jews understand that there were ages within each one of those ages? Yes, but they believed that there were essentially two ages. Now, by the way, they would very often use the plural of the form ages, aeonion. Even though it's a plural, they would use it to refer to a singular. That's known as heterosis. When the writers of the Bible would use 
a plural to refer to a singular. You see that in Hebrews chapter 9 when it speaks of the Old Covenant temple and the New Covenant. And he says the New Covenant temple, that is the heavenly temple, had to be sanctified with better sacrifices, plural, than the temple of the Old Covenant. Well, what was the heavenly temple sanctified with? The one sacrifice of Jesus. Not many, although he uses the plural. And E.W. Bullinger in his book on the, the figures uh, of speech in the Bible develops this concept of heterosis. So they would use a plural form for a singular, or, or by the way, they would even use a singular form to speak of plurals. It's just the way they did. I suspect that we do that, although I'm not good enough at language to figure that out. So, in, in the Jewish world of the first century, and by the way, this is extremely well documented. I haven't given any sources. I'm not going to take the time to document all of this. But you see this concept of two ages developed in N.T. Wright's writings today, R.T. France's writings today. You find it in such scholarly tomes as Emil Schur's uh, Jerusalem, or the Jews in the time of Jesus, the Messiah. I mean, they're just a wealth of information that documents what I'm sharing with you. The Jews believed in two ages. Point number two, they believed that the two ages were, number one, the age of Moses and the law. The second age is what they call the age to come. They call the age of Moses this age. They call the age of Messiah and the new covenant the age to come. Please catch the power of what I'm about to share with you. The Jews believe. Now, were there some dissenting voices within Judaism on this point? Yes, there were. That doesn't mean it wasn't still the dominant view, as these scholars that I just cited to you demonstrate. The Jews believed that this age, the, law, the, the age of Moses and the law, was supposed to end. They believed the age of Messiah and the new covenant would never end. Now let me suggest something to you. If you believe, if you agree, and if you admit that we are living in the age of the new covenant of Jesus Christ, you cannot logically and biblically believe in the end of the Christian new covenant age. You have to be able to demonstrate that Jesus completely and totally rejected the concept of two ages. You can't do that. So... When we come to Matthew chapter 24 and we find the disciples asking about the end of the age. Listen to me very carefully. If the disciples accepted the accepted norm teaching of the Jews of their day, that there were two ages, and those two ages were the age of Moses and the law, and the age to come was the age of Messiah and the new covenant. If they accepted that, and if they accepted that the age of Moses and the law was to come to an end, but the age of Messiah was to never end, then what do you suppose they had in mind when Jesus predicted the fall of Jerusalem, the end of the temple, and they said, well, Lord, tell us, when, what shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? They don't, they don't believe the end of uh, they don't believe the new covenant's ever going to end. And we're supposed to believe they're thinking about the end of the new covenant age? As I pointed out yesterday, what in the world would ever cause those disciples to think for even one moment that the destruction of the temple, the Jerusalem temple, the old covenant temple, would mean the end of the Christian age? Do you catch that? Folks, that's powerful stuff. Okay, I debated David Hester last year. I made that point. And I have to tell you this. There was, from my perspective standing in the pulpit, 
There was a visible electric shock that went through that audience. I saw people turning to one another and literally going. I saw husbands and wife turning to one another and going. I realized the power that that argument had, so I kept making the argument. And he never touched it top, side, or bottom. Once you catch the idea that there is no end of the new covenant age of Jesus, then when we come to Matthew 24 and verse 36, <coughs> pardon me, but of that day and hour, it's not talking about the end of the Christian age. Period. Story's over. Covenant eschatology has been established. Okay. I'm going to skip over the comments on Zechariah 14, except to say this. You know, everybody says, well, Matthew 24, 36... Of that day and hour? Well, it's got to be the end of the world. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. In Zechariah chapter 14, which a tremendous number of scholars, all millennial, post millennial, agree is talking about the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Well, Zechariah 14, verse 8 says what? It is a day known to the Lord. And some translations even render it, it is a day known only to the Lord. Okay, so we got an Old Testament prophecy of the A.D. 70 fall of Jerusalem, and it's described as a day known only to the Lord. Here is Jesus talking about the impending fall of Jerusalem. At least he has been. And he says, it's a day known only to the Lord. Huh, wonder what he might have, wonder where he got that idea. Okay, got to hurry up. I suggest that one of the fallacies of appealing to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36 and trying to apply it to a so-called end of time coming is that it completely overlooks the festal reference that is found in that terminology. And, and look, I, I have said this on different occasions. I lament the fact that I lived so long in my life and I studied hard, but I lament the fact that I lived so long and I was so absolutely, totally ignorant of the, of the significance and the importance of Israel's feast days in the fulfillment of God's eschatological schema. I didn't have a clue. What's that saying? I was dumb as a rock. I heard David Curtis, great, great guy. I heard David Cur Curtis give a lesson some years ago on the significance of the feast days. And after he was through, I turned to my wife and I said, why have I lived so long and not known this stuff? And quite frankly, I was ashamed of myself. Now I have to tell you, I've been studying hard on the feast days ever since then. And I'm just beginning to get that much of a grasp of it. But it's some of the most exciting stuff I've ever touched in reference to eschatology. I shared some of my thoughts on one occasion, and I've got to hurry here. Uh, I shared some of my thoughts on one occasion with Doug Wilkin, uh, Wilkinson. His book is on the table back there. And I developed just a little bit, and, and Doug wrote back, and he said, You know, Don, I'm pretty sure I don't know as much as you do about it. But he said, based on what you've told me, he said, I've come to the con conclusion that Israel's feast days are the Rosetta Stone of eschatology. And I love that. And I think he's absolutely right. Now you may be wondering about this juncture and you say, well, Don, what in the world does Matthew 24 verse 36 have to do with Israel's feast days? Everything in the world. Israel had seven feast days. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of time. I may not get through all of my, uh, all of my charts. I've only got nine hundred. So, <laughs> you, uh, I will, pardon me, I, I will not get through them. But I really, really want to share this with you. This is such exciting stuff. Israel had seven feast days, four spring festivals, three fall festivals. 
I won't talk about the first four. I won't take that time. The last three feasts of Israel were Rosh Hashanah, Feast of Trumpets, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, Feast of Harvest. Now, there was an eighth feast. And I've just got to tell you something. About two years ago, I think it was, Jim, was the, when, when, when you sent me that material, I get an email from Jim Wade. You know, Jim and Sharon are absolutely fantastic. They're just indispensable to us uh, in preparation for this. And, and Jim is a really, really good student of the Word. So he, he sends me this email and he says, Hey, Don, have you ever heard of Shemini Atzerat? And I thought, well, his fingers must have slipped on the keys or something. I'd never heard the term. See, back to my ignorance. And he says, Don, you really need to look at Leviticus 23. And you need to look at this concept of Shemini Atzerat. Well, I could go on and on and on about it. But I can't go on and on and on about it. Simply stated, Sukkot was the, seventh, the last feast of the year, technically speaking, was a seventh day feast, seven day feast. But in Leviticus chapter 23, it says on the eighth day. On the eighth day. Sukkot is over. But on the eighth day, it shall be a Sabbath unto you. You know what Shemini Atzerat designated or signified to the Jews? Celebration. It signified the new creation. It, it signified the year is starting all over again. Their life in Yahweh is starting. All, and as I had one Hebrew scholar in Israel explain to me, he said, you can even express it like this. It means we survived. The day of judgment, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. And it's a day of pure unmitigated joy. Now see, I'm writing a book right now. I've already been told by some of you that I can't keep my title. But I'm writing a book right now on the Sabbath. And the working title of the book has been for some time, Celebrating the Eighth Day, Shemini Atzerat. And everybody I've shared that title with, they say, no. Nobody knows what Shemini Atzerat is. I understand that. I certainly didn't. But if you grasp what Shemini Atzerat is about, if you grasp the significance of the eighth day, you will very, very quickly realize that seventh day observance is not for Christians. Meaning no offense whatsoever to anyone that may be listening that may have Sabbatarian beliefs. This is incredible. And you're thinking, okay, Preston, when are you going to explain? <laughs> but of that day and hour, okay. What was Rosh Hashanah? It was the Feast of Trumpets. What did the Feast of Trumpets represent? The Day of Judgment. Huh. What were they waiting on in the New Testament? After Pentecost, which was the last of the spring four feasts. What were they waiting on? Oh, by the way, I'm getting carried away here. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, boy, I may not get to many more of these charts on the day and hour. I'm going to get to as many as possible. But you just got, hopefully you can tap into my enthusiasm about this. Do you realize that after, after the fulfillment of, or after Pentecost, there was a period of four months and that period of four months, you know what some of the rabbis call that? The time of waiting for the judgment. Oh my goodness. In Acts chapter 3, Peter called on his audience, Repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out and that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Do you know what the times of refreshing means? It, the word refreshing is from the Greek word onyxousios. I'm sure I didn't pronounce that correctly. <laughs> I'll have to get Gerald to, uh, Davis to help me with the pronunciation of it. But what it essentially means is a time of respite or relief from judgment. Pentecost is over. 
Peter is calling on his audience, repent, and God will not bring judgment. Oh, Rosh Hashanah is coming. But if you repent, you will go through judgment without being condemned. Okay, here's the really cool stuff about Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah was what, it, what was known as a new moon festival. Now what that meant was the festival could not start and it was the singular distinctive feast that could not begin until the new moon was witnessed. Well, guess what? If it's cloudy, you can't see the new moon, right? And by the way, does anyone realize that the new moon is just that little bitty sliver of the moon that's visible? It's not the big moon. It's not the full moon. The new moon is just that tiny, tiny little sliver of the moon that very first begins to reveal the moon. Tough to see. So if it's cloudy, you don't know when the new moon starts. If it's foggy and if it's raining, you can't see the new moon. So, since there was uncertainty about Rosh Hashanah, since there was uncertainty about the appearance of the new moon, and since it had to be witnessed before Rosh Hashanah could take place, the high priest would send three witnesses out to this mountaintop. He would send three witnesses out here, and he would send three witnesses out here. And from their different perspectives, the moment that the new moon was seen, the witnesses would run back. So they had to have two or three witnesses. One was not enough. They'd run back to the high priest and say, the new moon has been seen. And the high priest would declare, Rosh Hashanah can begin. Do you know what the ancient Jews called Rosh Hashanah among nine other names that it had? Actually, Rosh Hashanah had 10 names, 10 titles, every one of them incredibly typologically significant, thrilling to study. See, Jim Wade started me on this trek. It's all his fault. <laughs> but do you know what the ancient rabbis called Rosh Hashanah? It is the feast concerning which Are you ahead of me? You see the train coming? No man knows the day or the hour. Now, when you couple that festal reference with the fact that in the Olivet Discourse, there are a minimum, according to my documentation so far, there are a minimum of five other direct references to the Jewish feast days in the Olivet Discourse? At least five. That's just in my limited knowledge so far. Now let me ask you a question. Are we supposed to ignore all that? Here's a Jew. He's just been in the temple where all the festivals are, you know, celebrated. Are we supposed to ignore all these festal references that he gives to his disciples who have observed Rosh Hashanah, the feast concerning which no man knows the day or the hour, all of their life? No, I don't think we're supposed to ignore that at all. So I suggest to you, the point, my point being, that when Jesus said, but of that day and hour knows no man, no, not the angels, not the Son, but the Father only, I suggest to you that Jesus was cryptically, enigmatically, kind of subtly but powerfully saying to his disciples, you don't know exactly when it's coming, but it'll come. It will break in during Rosh Hashanah. And very quickly, go back to Matthew 23, 39. What had Jesus just said, your house is left to you desolate. Verily I say unto you, unto you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And my dispensational friends say, oh, well, you see, 
up to that verse, Jesus has been talking about the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Now, however, he speaks of a yet future time, future to us today, which is ostensibly Romans eleven twenty five to 27, at which Israel, during the period of the tribulation, they realize they're about to perish. And they will cry out to, to Yahweh, and the, Yahweh will send his son at the height of the tribulation. And they will say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, because he'll save them from the Antichrist and the great tribulation. Well, here's the problem with that. It ignores the Jewish feast, uh, feast days. You see that, that statement, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which comes from Psalms 118. Psalms 118, it, it sits in the middle of a cluster of psalms that were known as the song of a, songs of ascent. What in the world is a song of ascent, right? During the feast days, caravans would come from far distant places of Jews to come to Jerusalem to worship. The inhabitants of Jerusalem would watch for them when they would see far off those caravans coming. You know what they did? The citizens of Jerusalem, as many as possible, would climb up on the walls, and the parapets of the, of the walls of Jerusalem, and they all together would sing, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Boy, can you imagine what that was, would be like with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people on the walls of Jerusalem singing, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the, and the caravans joining, it, joining in the singing. What an incredible thing. Pardon me, my voice is trying to give out. What an incredible thing that must have been to witness. And even to participate in. When was that song sung? Oh, with the approach of Rosh Hashanah of Matthew 24, 36. Now I would suggest to you, therefore, oh, by the way, just as a casual point here, you do realize, I hope, that the Romans besieged Jerusalem while the Jews were in the city to celebrate their feast days. Yeah, that's not accidental. It's not coincidental. It was providential. So unless we are, are able to completely divorce Jesus' reference to, to blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord from the feast days, unless we are completely definitively able to divorce Matthew 24 verse 36 from the Jewish feast days, from history, knowing that the Romans besieged Jerusalem during the feast days, including Rosh Hashanah. Unless we're able to do that, would not good hermeneutic demand that we honor those time-restrictive statements? And instead of honoring those time-restrictive statements as belonging to Israel's feast days, the time of their observance, which, by the way, ended in AD 70. No, they do not go to Jerusalem to observe the feast days as they did prior to AD 70. So if we're not able to divorce all of that, from Matthew 24, 36, what would be our basis for applying Matthew chapter 24, 36 to a supposed end of time? What we're being asked to do, in other words, is to isolate ourselves from Jesus' world, from His culture, from His religion, from His to use the German term, German scholar's term, the Zetzenleben, from his own life situation. That was his world. 
And 99% of all Bible commentaries completely divorce Matthew 24, verse 36 from Jesus' real world. What is the authority for doing that? You want to get the power of that? Boy, I tell you. <laughs> Once we see the connection of, of the Olivet Discourse with the feast days, if it doesn't transform our understanding of the Olivet Discourse, I don't know what would. Okay, well, after those introductory remarks, uh, <laughs> what time am I supposed to shut up? What time is it, Jan? Do what? I've got 15 minutes? Oh, I've got nine minutes. Okay. Along with ignoring the Jewish festival references in the Olivet Discourse in order to make Matthew chapter 24, 36 apply to some end of time, I really believe that we have to ignore Jesus' teaching concerning the revelatory spirit. Now, let me go through this very, very quickly. When Jesus spoke the words that he did in Matthew 24, 36, very clearly, he did not know the time of his parousia. That doesn't mean he didn't know the generation. It says he didn't know the day and the hour. Now, there's some more I could say about day and hour, but I won't at this point. But I want you to notice that from the time he spoke the Olivet Discourse, that we conflate that with John chapter 16, verses 7 to 13. Jesus speaking to his apostles just before he's going to be delivered to his death. He says, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now watch this. When he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they do not believe me. Of righteousness because I go to the Father and you see me no more. Of judgment because the ruler of this judgment, a ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you are not yet able to bear them. You know, I, I hear people condemn advocates of covenant eschatology all the time for being secretive, you know, private. After all, if we had any courage, if we really believed what we believe, we wouldn't keep anything back. Oh, I wonder why Jesus kept back a whole bunch of stuff from his own apostles until after he was resurrected. Because he said, guys, you're not, you're not able to accept yet. Not everybody is at a point in their spiritual journey in which they're able to absorb everything. Can't talk anymore about that. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. Now, what's he going to speak about? Sin, righteousness, and judgment. He will show you things to come. So the power of this is, when the Spirit was given, he would guide the apostles into knowledge of things to come, and even concerning judgment. So very quickly, when the Spirit was given, he would guide the apostles into knowledge of things to come concerning the judgment. You do understand that every single one of the New Testament, New Testament epistles and the Gospels were written after the Holy Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Every one of them. What does that mean? It means that those apostles who were with Jesus when he said, but of that day and hour knows no man, they clearly did not know the time at that time but he told them, the Holy Spirit is going to be sent to you. He's going to guide you into all truth. Wayne Jackson, an outspoken critic of covenant eschatology, wrote in, one of, in his journal called The Christian Courier, 
If Jesus Christ himself did not know the time of his coming, then it's very clear that Peter and John and James could not know the time. So, in other words, the Father couldn't reveal that to them. So what did those apostles inspired by the Spirit, sent by the Father, who knew the day and the hour about Jesus' Jesus' coming, say about the coming day of the Lord? Well, I recommend you get a copy of Doug uh, Wilkinson's book or Tony Denton's book, which is on the table back there, in which they chronicle passage after passage after passage that says the day of the Lord was at hand. Now remember, they've got the Holy Spirit sent by the Father, Who knew the day and the hour, who would reveal to them things to come. Now watch this. How much time? 30 minutes, she says. Thank you. (laughs) I want turn your Bible, please, with me to Romans chapter 13, 11 and following. I I I tell you what, folks, this along with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 is absolutely incredible, along with a whole bunch of other verses. I'll try to get to uh, one other. In Romans 13, 11, uh, 13, verse 11 and 12, Paul says, And now do this, knowing, he uses the Greek word, idotes. Now, idotes can be used to, to refer to things that you fully understand. Jesus said to the Sadducees, You do err not knowing the Scriptures. Now look, folks, let, let's admit it. If you wanted to ask a, a Sadducee to quote the, the Bible, he could quote, you know, the Decalogue to you. And the Pentateuch. Verbatim. So to say they did not know the scriptures. He's using idotes to say. You don't understand. You don't comprehend properly. What the scriptures say. That's this word. And now knowing. Comprehending. The time. Well the word time there. Is the Greek word kairos. Kairos means the divinely appointed time. So Paul says to the Romans, you fully understand that the appointed time, now watch what he says, that now, Greek word noon, not 12 o'clock, but at this present time, now in most translations it says, it is high time. Well, the literal of it is, it is definite article, the hour to a wake out of sleep. Well, what, did, what does that wake out of sleep mean? It's resurrection. Daniel chapter 12. Many of those who are asleep in the dust of the earth shall arise. And now Paul is writing to people and he says, you know what, folks? It is the hour. Uh, Jesus said the hour is coming in which those that are in the grave shall come forth. They'll hear the Son of Man and come forth. And now Paul's writing to people and he says, the hour has come. What else did he say? Now look, Paul says, you know. You know what time it is. No, 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 Paul, surely you are mistaken because Jesus said no man knows the day or the hour. Paul said, you know the hour. You comprehend what time it is. Now, folks, how could Paul say that? Because he had the revelatory spirit given to him by the Father who knew the day and the hour. And it was that spirit that revealed to him the divinely appointed time, the divinely appointed hour has come. Well, I've got, to, I've got to hurry. Go to Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. I love this. <laughs> I mean, if this isn't powerful, I really don't know what is. The whole book. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, that's the Father. Uh, let's see, that's the Father who knew the day and the hour, right? The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to Him. So the Father is speaking to the Son. The Son is showing these things to His servants, including John. 
And he, that's the Father who knew the day and the hour, sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. So you have the Father, you have Jesus, the angel, and John. There's a process of revelation here. But here's the, po here's the point. Where's this information coming from? Well, let's see, it's not coming from John. Right? It wasn't John giving wishful thinking. It wasn't John speaking out of turn. Well, let's see. Was it the angel? Nope. Was it Jesus in his incarnate ignorance? No. It was the Father who knew the day and the hour saying to the Son, tell the angel to tell John to tell the churches, these things must shortly come to pass. The time, the kairos, the, the divinely appointed time is at hand. I'll, I'll just have to close it off there, but let me conclude by saying, to appeal to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36 is as applicable in, a, in all of the epistles in which the New Testament writers said that the day of the Lord was at hand. The end of all things has, has arrived. The time for the judgment has arrived. It is a hermeneutic of an anachronism. It is taking something that was true at one point of time and applying it at another point of time in which it is improper to apply it. Noah, build an ark. I want to know how many of you have started your ark. How many of you have your ark in the backyard? It was true then, it's not true now. It was applicable then, it's not applicable now. Why is that so hard to understand? Well, it's hard to understand if we have a preconceived idea of what the day of the Lord is supposed to be like. Well, thank you for your attention. I will call it quits on that. But I hope you can see that Matthew 24, 36 is not applicable today. The New Testament writers, writing by inspiration of the revelatory spirit sent by the Father who knew the day and the hour, it is those apostles who said, and now in a very, very little while, hoson, hoson, mikron in the Greek, the one who is coming will come, and he will not delay. I think it's time to put aside the hermeneutic of anachronism and accept those New Testament statements. All right, thank you so very much. Um, uh, we're going to take a break now. It's, what is two-hour break? I've, I've forgotten, babe. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, that, that's what we got planned, and it will be a good meal, folks. So please take advantage of it. I, I think we ordered 100 meals. Yes. Do what? Oh, oh, yes, yes. During the meal, I've already announced it once, but I don't want to forget it. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, during the meal, we have... Uh, Joseph and Marchesa, who are going to sing for us. Uh, as I mentioned, they've done this uh, in the past, at least Marchesa has. And so you'll enjoy this, so be sure to hang around that. They're going to sing for us during the meal, all right? Thank you again. You're dismissed until 5.30, or shortly around that time. Huh? I